I would now like to introduce uh, Ovid Mercury. Ovid Mercury will be doing a statement with respect to Treaty 5 and a recognition on the spirit and intent of treaties. Ovid. Nistam, first. I will thank the chiefs who are here. And I want to acknowledge the great work that has been done by Chief Kent and Chief Easter and by uh, Louis Harper and his team being able to bring us all together like this to share some time together and to reconnect with uh, our vision and to establish a, a, a way forward in our relationship with a country called Canada. And I want to recognize, of course, the Grand Chiefs that are here uh, because they work for us, they speak for us, and they fight for us. And the elders, for your knowledge and, and for the great wisdom that you have kept over the, over the years, and the young, young people who are here that will walk that path that we, that, we, that we clear for them. And of course the woman where the power is. This is a statement to the crown. It's a statement of this summit, the summit of 25 sovereign nations made at Black River First Nations, July 11, 2019. First I begin, we are grateful to our creator, Ishchi Manitou, and our ancestors for bringing us together on this historic day. Just as it was when Treaty 5 was considered at different times by our ancestors and the Crown representatives, the sun still shines, the grass still grows, and the rivers still flow. There, in just a few words, is the beauty of our natural laws of our Creator, taught to our people, and left to us to follow, respect, and nurture as a source of life on our lands and territories. Kakige, mina kakige. We are gathered here as present day representatives of our past, present, and future. As no settler can speak for us, the responsibility and the duty to honor the spirit and intent of Treaty 5, consistent with the Creator's truth, befalls in the good minds and hearts of our people. We are gathered to tell our story, which began many centuries before Canada became a country. We rejoice for the kindness, vision, and foresight of our great ancestors. We remain proud of their leadership and their vision regarding our coexistence with the settler society. Clearly they knew change was coming, and indeed it was happening during their life, just as it is in our time. We acknowledge and give thanks to the Minister of the Crown, the Honorable Carolyn Bennett, for being here today to listen to the voices of our people on a matter so important to us. We have waited a long time for Canada to respect and honor our treaty. Many times we have thought the delay was deliberate and tied to the federal and provincial government policies of neglect and extinguishment. We often think that the colonial strategy which includes the totalitarian regime of the Indian Act and the residential schools for our complete assimilation was and remains the plan that we will forget our treaties and disappear. We will not forget and we will not disappear. We believe that the honor of the crown means respecting the truth and complying with the obligations and promises. In the past, we have angered Canadians 
met resistance and dismissal from successive federal and provincial governments each time we asserted our treaty and Aboriginal rights. We now know that our approach must be fighting against the single understanding of the treaty that has been unilaterally perpetuate, perpetuated by the political and legal world of Canada. But we are not deflated and far from being defeated in our quest for treaty justice. There is a higher law than Canadian law. It is called treaty law. Treaty law is a law as understood by the parties related, relating to a solemn undertaking called a treaty. It is not the interpretation of just one party. It is the meeting of the minds, hearts, and souls. Let's just call it a double understanding of the treaty. To be clear, we say categorically, we reject the single understanding of Treaty 5 as interpreted and enforced by Canada. We are fortified by our ancestral knowledge that there is a higher law than treaty law. It is the Creator's laws of life on earth for every human being and all other beings. These sacred laws surround us, surrounded us the day before treaty, the day of the treaty, and the day after the treaty. These are higher responsibilities and obligations to the earth, like water, land, resources, and all non-human life. In other words, we are more than individuals and nations of people. We have duties beyond our immediate needs and demands of citizens and countries. Our common survival and that of the earth is dependent on these higher laws. To be blunt, constitutional and corporate laws do not override sacred law. For many years now, we have watched our treaty rights being eroded and taken away by federal and provincial laws. In many cases, without our knowledge, and in every case, without our consent. What are some of these laws? The Natural Resources Transfer Agreement Act, the Migratory Birds, the Migratory Birds Convention Act, wildlife and conservation laws, mining and forestry laws, child welfare legislation, the banning of our traditional spiritual ceremonies, the Indian Act permit system, the prohibition against our people from hiring lawyers to protect their treaty rights, and the sale of crown lands to private owners, to, mean, to name a few. We have seen Canadian citizens and corporations come to our territories to exploit our inherent resources for their advantage and for the benefit of a province and Canada. The economic, of, the economic progress of Canadians and of this country have rendered our livelihoods virtually non-existent, leaving our people to live in poverty. The destruction of our lands by hydro development, forestry, mining, and the taking of our lands for other works have happened without regard to Treaty 5. Our people who had hoped that Treaty 5 would help their social and economic progress are left to watch the rise of wealth for Canadians and for Canada. Unfortunately, for our children and those yet to be born, the coexistence our ancestors believed the settler would honor did not last. Instead, Canada began to impose its will and power with impunity and dismissed the treaty as an historic document to be left in the archives and forgotten. We did not forget. We are determined to honor the treaty in a manner that we know it should be interpreted, respected, and implemented for the common good of our people. Our people are resilient, and we shall someday soon enjoy the fruits of Treaty 5. We will weigh all our options and make wise decisions to secure a bright future for all our people. Canada will no longer remain as a sole beneficiary of Treaty 5. We make this, sol this solemn promise to our people and for the benefit of future, genera future generations of our nations. We have not forgotten our treaty. Since this treaty was made by our ancestors, we have often thought about the honor 
of the other party to the treaty? When will they respect the treaty? When will they honor their promises and obligations? Why has the other party pretended we have given up all our ancestral rights and freedoms? But let it be known that we never surrendered our lands and our sovereignty of our people and the resources abundant on our territories. We have, we have wondered about the honor of the crown. Our gathering here today as distinct people and nations is not the first nor the last time we have assembled to, remain, to remind the crown to honor Treaty 5 as known and understood by our people. 28 years ago, on June the 26, 27, and 28, in 1991, Treaty 5 First Nations held a conference in Winnipeg. At that major gathering, our chiefs and elders from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario issued the following declaration. We, the First Nations of Treaty 5, declare, the Creator put us here. The Creator gave us life, inherent rights, and laws which govern our relationships with nature and all peoples in the spirit of coexistence. The First Nations of Treaty 5 are sovereign people and have an inherent right to self-government and self-determination based on the customs, traditions, values, and practices. Our First Nations entered into Treaty 5 with the Crown on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. Treaty 5 confirms the legal and political relationship between the First Nations of Treaty 5 and the Crown. The First Nations of Treaty 5 reserve the right to interpret and implement the spirit and intent of Treaty 5 and the Treaty 5 making process as defined to us orally by our respected elders. The First Nations of Treaty 5 shall uphold and protect the terms, conditions, and provisions of Treaty 5 as, as interpreted by us. The First Nations of Treaty 5 have a sacred obligation and a responsibility to apply and enforce our inherent and treaty rights. As equal part parties, we, the individual First Nations of Treaty 5, agree to unite and implement actions that will ensure the spirit and intent of Treaty 5 is protected and enforced. This declaration was signed on the 28th day of June, 1991, in the city of Winnipeg, in the province of Manitoba. We are sovereign nations who made a treaty with the settler crown. It was done with the recognition and understanding that we are independent people who want a peaceful relationship with the settler society. Our ancestors never relinquished our title to our lands, waters, and resources. Yet, with deliberate intent and bad faith, the Crown proceeded after treaty to assert full dominion over our lands and territories. This is not the meaning of our treaty with the Crown. We do not believe that one party to a treaty can unilaterally determine the meaning of the treaty. If and when provisions are disputed as to the scope and meaning of any provision, the intent and meaning should be resolved by further discussion as opposed to unilateral and unconscionable interpretations as, as was done here by the Crown. Furthermore, in the absence of political agreement, the meaning and scope of treaty should not be the prerogative of the laws and courts of the Crown. We have laws too, and we have our ways of resolving conflicts between parties to a dispute. Recently, under Canadian law, the courts have recognized the unconscionable act of the unilateral interpretation of treaties. We agree in full with the understanding that our treaty cannot in be interpreted solely by the Crown. However, we do not agree that the Canadian court solution to this injustice is complete. Although the idea that treaties should be liberally construed and ambiguities or doubtful expressions should be resolved in favor of Aboriginal signatories is a step in the right direction, it is not the full answer. Any meaning that is in dispute should be dealt with politically 
and in the absence of political agreement, there should be a permanent independent treaty tribunal jointly established by the parties to the treaty for dealing with the disputes about the scope and intent of treaties. We have waited for Canada to return to the treaty talks that were started with Treaty 5 in 1875. Our treaty is a living document. It is the foundation of our relationship with the Crown and Canada. Given the fact that we have different understandings about Treaty 5, this fact alone should compel Canada to continue the treaty talks that were started but never concluded. Our understanding of Treaty 5 requires reconciliation and treaty justice. We need to continue talks about reconciling Canada's assertion of sovereignty with our self-rule and sovereignty as Indigenous nations. We have our understanding of, of treaty rights to education, health, livelihood, farming, and to hunting, fishing, and trapping, and gathering rights. We also know about our rights to shelter, land, air, and water. We know our obligation to respect and uphold the laws of the Creator. We believe without question that our nations were put on our homelands with our instructions that are higher obligations to man-made laws. We regard our obligations to protect our water, land, and resources as sacred duties. We are man mindful also of the disparity of the size of our reserves compared with the other number treaties. We are unhappy with, our, with your foreign legal traditions and in particular about how your lawmakers have attempted over so many years to undermine our, our inherent authority, traditions, culture, and laws. We have not forgotten our promise to live in peace and to allow for settlement and the sharing of resources. But let us be clear, this does not mean Canada can take it all and just leave us the reserves. In addition, we have concerns about the jurisdiction and laws of provinces that are enforced contrary to our knowledge about Treaty 5. We have problems with corporations having more rights than our people and our people have to access and generate wealth from our traditional lands. We know that Canada does not agree with us, even in matters that are expressly mentioned in the Crown's written text of Treaty 5. But for this country to proceed as if all is resolved in its favor will amount to a fundamental breach of treaty and put into doubt that political and legal reality of Canada and its claims for territorial integrity. What is at stake here for Canada as a country is more than its reputation. The legitimacy of Canada is dependent upon honoring treaties like Treaty 5. It is not easy for us to trust the Crown, but we see that our contemporary duty is to protect our treaty and rights. This duty to our ancestors and people remains a, a principal reason why we are reminding the Crown that treaty talks have to continue until there is, a, there is, there is truth and a meeting of the minds. What does the treaty mean for Canadians and Canada? Surely no one can rejoice on how the dismissal of treaty rights and the neglect of successive Canadian governments to honor treaty has made us the poorest people in our homelands. Given the vast resources and wealth that is generated from our traditional land that Canada cannot continue for the next 150 years as if we do not matter and that our knowledge and understanding of Treaty 5 is not relevant to this country. Canada's legitimacy and continued existence is subject to and dependent on the honoring the our treaties as indigenous nations. For our people, Treaty 5 means much more to us. It means honoring the vision of our ancestors what the vision and foresight to make a treaty that would uplift our people and find a secure, mutually beneficial and sacred compact for our 
peaceful coexistence with the settler society. Treaty 5 was intended by our ancestors to usher in a new era in the rise of our indigenous nations. This vision can be recalled by referencing the provisions for agriculture, education, and the pursuit of avocations, meaning our livelihood, or the development of new sources of revenue and wealth. For our people, the treaty is about the well-being and health of our people and the continuation of our distinct identities and cultures, including our ceremonies and spirituality and languages. It represented the affirmation of our self-determination and the continuation of our sovereignty of, over our lands, waters, and resources. It was never about dependency on the settler society. It was never about the surrender of our freedoms. It was never about giving away our land. The vision was about our people and the settler society establishing a mutually beneficial compact on Mother Earth. <laughs>